I'd like to welcome you all to our 15th uh, annual uh, Economic Ground Trust Services Economic Conference. Obviously, the star, uh, as he has been for about 21 years, is uh, Dr. Woody Brock. Uh, very much welcome you, Woody, and look forward to your talk. Um, a couple of words about Woody, um, and in case many of you have not heard this, uh, here it is again. Woody is the president and founder of Strategic Economic Decisions. And it specializes in the applications of the modern economics of uncertainty to forecasting and risk assessment in the international economy and asset markets. Uh, Woody holds a number of degrees. Uh, he has spoken extensively. He has written extensively. And I would like to remind you that he has a book coming out in January called American Gridlock. I would urge you all to, uh, to read that. Um, Woody uh, founded Strategic Economic Decisions in 1985 and was sponsored by a number of institutions, including Fidelity, GE Capital, IBM Pension Funds, and a number of others, looking for a deeper level of analysis in interest rates and in the economy. And in its research, uh, the company has focused on apprehending ongoing structural changes in the economy and markets to help clients like us avoid the pitfalls of illegitimately extrapolating the past into the future. Woody today is going to talk on four topics, which are, uh, and maybe others, uh, but four which are outlined on the screen. And the first one is the malaise in the West, the collision of two fronts. The second is the demise of the Euro and the macro controllability. The third is Alice in Wonderland investing, my favorite, when companies become safe and countries become risky. This, this is a wonderful observation. Uh, number four is who is to blame for the decline of the West. So without more ado, we will welcome Woody. There will be questions afterwards. And um, for the uh, sake of um, Woody's uh, uh, good speaking, if we could turn our cell phones off, that would be terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's sort of like getting home. I live in the summers in Gloucester across the water. And my hope is one day to just take a boat over. It's so much quicker. I have to first save up and buy the boat. Anyway. I do have a book coming out. American Gridlock, Why the Left and the Right Are Both Wrong. Common Sense 101 Solutions to our problems. I'll just mention the book because it touches on things that I will be saying today and have been saying for 20 years. The first goal of the book is to identify five problems that I think the nation simply has to solve. These are problems like bankruptcy for Medicare and Social Security, an obvious one. More immediately, what do we do about this lost decade where we could see permanent U6 unemployment of 17%? How do you deal with thugs like China in your bargaining? What do you do to avoid being taken advantage of repeatedly as we have? There's nothing wrong with China becoming a great country. It's great. But if you know trade theory, you'll know that when you go from being the 31st to the second largest economy on Earth, and you have a huge success, your currency against, say, an old dollar would rise three to four hundred percent conservatively. It seems to be a dirty little secret that so staggering has been the manipulation by China that its currency today is 47 percent lower than in 1990. That is not the way it's supposed to be. When seven million people lose good jobs because of it, more than they would have had they played fair and square, which is all anybody wants, we'd be a lot less in trouble than we are. Another problem we have to face is the distribution of income and wealth. This is a very explosive topic. It is one that's completely misunderstood. Pure capitalism, by one of the most important theorems in the history of economic theory, in 1953 by the Nobel Kenneth Arrow, shows that true capitalist efficiency requires that everybody would have been every night optimally hedged against all risks of every kind. On 
unfortunately, 95% of the risks aren't hedged. You can't find somebody to underwrite one of the biggest risks in all of your own personal lives, the great risk that on your wedding night you prove impotent. <laughs> or that the value of your portfolio falls in half the day before you retire and annuitize it. Or about the value of your house. The fundamental theorem then says to the extent that we are not hedged, the resulting allocation is inefficient. The correct remedy is you use the income tax rate to serve as a surrogate for the fact that the lucky who win big and did not have insurance, so that they did not have to pay back big, will then end up much less risk rich than they would have had you had true capitalism. Now, I'm not going to go into this now. It's very disturbing to people. We'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about who's to blame for applying to the risks. The point I'm simply making is we cannot go on the way we are, where indeed a Warren Buffett pays half the tax rate of his receptionist. It's simply not appropriate. And neither the left adopts it, nor the right as a subject worth real discussion. The litmus test today is very simply, do you want the Bush tax cuts back or not? The right says we do not want to give them up. The left says we must give them up and tax the rich more. What absolute idiots. Does anyone think that the tax rates before or after Bush have anything to do with what is correct or ideal or fair? No, they don't. But that's the level of shallowness of our discourse. And I think there's another problem. The second goal of the book is to show you how you can arrive at solutions to all these problems using higher order deductive logic. We live in a world of a screaming dialogue of the deaf. The left wing hires left wing think tanks to cherry pick new data to support its left wing views. The right wing does exactly the same. Induction, which is the process of using data to make inferences <coughs> and write policies, simply isn't very good. All important advances in science, not maybe all, but most, game theory, supply demand theory, Newton's laws, Einstein's laws, <coughs> Galois theory, whatever, came from very smart people laying down axioms in their bathtubs and deducing F equals M. <coughs> Data played a role in testing such a theory after it existed. John Nash, my Princeton teacher, the beautiful mind, pure mathematician, <coughs> from seven axioms to do so there is one only one solution to the bargaining problem. What threats we make during bargaining and how we end up dividing the pie. If most people were asked to solve that problem and ask is there a general function that solves it in all cases, you want to run a thousand psychological experiments and do this and do that, you would have gotten absolutely nowhere. You would have thought of all the factors that would matter in bargaining, wouldn't you? There are not. The bargaining outcome depends upon one and only one way in which I differ from you, my relative risk aversion. The process of bargaining is risky. You could go home empty handed if you don't strike a deal. Somebody more willing to press for their demands, more risk prone, will bargain the other person down. Forty years later, I proved mathematically that this is equivalent to a related concept that the person who is more needy gets bargained down by the person who is less needy. If you haven't eaten and you have two hungry kids at home, you will settle for a quarter of a pie. You can't go home and be handed. The guy that had a hot punch Sunday five minutes ago really doesn't care less about getting the pie and will bargain you down. This is a more intuitive source of support. The third and final goal of the book is that having shown an extremely difficult problem can be solved in a way where you follow from assumptions that your dog would accept to conclusions that are hopefully unique, <laughs> as in Medicare, to con basically to contain the bankruptcy of the country. It turns out there is one and only one solution to the entire medical care system at an abstract level. In economic jargon, the supply curve has to move out faster than the demand. 
That's all you need. And every policy must be tested against that criteria. And if this is done, total expenditure, now 18% of GDP, will peak and then go down to zero, like the price of phone calls. If it isn't done, and under Obamacare, the demand curve is going up much faster than the supply curve, you are bankrupt completely. These are not opinions. These are theorems. So if you have a system where you think deeper and think better and you deduce solutions from first principles, what happens is by the time you get to the conclusion, you all agree on it. Shut up, next topic. Remember in geometry, as children, you learn Euclid's axioms. 30 pages later, it is proven that all triangles of any kind have angles that sum to 180 degrees. There are no right-wing triangles where that's not true. <laughs> Shut up, next topic. That's the kind of logic I was trained in, but it's very rare today, very rare, where today we think data dumps from the internet and spreadsheets are going to tell us anything. They don't. All that happens is you end up getting politicized induction. So the final goal of the book is to break the gridlock, <coughs> break the dialogue of the deaf. But you can't do that unless you show first that there really are solutions to our biggest problem. The good news is that they are. The bad news is that the sun will burn out and we won't be around. Let me start with a discussion of the mind of the market. It's pretty unusual what's going on. The market up one week 500 points, one day 500 points, then down 600, down 300, back and forth. It's like the blind leading the blind. Well, it is the blind leading the blind at a certain level of abstraction. There was a time when if we heard the news, we would know what the new price would be of, say, a bond. Bonds are supposed to have interest rate yields equal to the sort of natural growth rate of the country, 2%, plus the inflation rate. If you go back over 60 years, you'll find it followed the model perfectly. Inflation was 2%. Bonds were 4 and a half. But not starting in 1970. Inflation went, if you remember, to 14.8% in 1981. Bond yields went up by the same amount as inflation. 1,000 basis points. <coughs> Bonds perform exactly as the model says. Then, starting with Paul Volcker, the inflation rate fell back over 25 years, from 15 to 3, and bond yields fell back from 15 to 3 and a half. The model worked. It never worked with dot coms or currencies where no one has a clue how to value the news. When people don't have a clue and the blind lead the blind, it is a theorem that that will cause the overshoot that you see with things like mortgage-backed securities, which Ben Bernanke publicly said the Holy Ghost didn't have a clue how to price, or dot com, or currency. What's happening now is a confusion in the market, which is going to do the same to government bonds. They're no longer going to be the good behaved asset that follows the model perfect. Look at the bonds in Europe. Yields on Greek bonds can go from 6 to 60%. But inflation didn't change at all. It's all gossip and speculation about who will go broke next. Whose credit rating will be downgraded next? Well, your guess is as good as mine on that one. So once again, this confusion of results is leading to a transformation of the very riskiness of a bond. A bond used to be risky only because, and only because, you weren't sure what would happen to inflation. If the Lord told you what happened to inflation, you would know the value of your bond. When no one knows how to value a bond, it gets very tricky and volatile. Why are people confused? What's going on here? My personal view on this is that the market today is caught between two weather fronts that are colliding. As when two weather fronts collide, everything is what mathematicians call nonlinear. 
chaotic. Clear or turbulence is a perfect example. So is if you take the Newburyport River down and run into the Gulf of Maine. You'll see standing waves and vortices and weird things going on. It's not due to the wind. This is a thermal interaction. It's the same reason why there's never been a beach where two waves have ever been the same. Why this is true is that the laws that govern thermal gradients are such that when you see these weird phenomena, what you are seeing is the integration of simultaneous nonlinear non -linear partial differential operators. If you remember any math, that's really messy stuff. Whereas if I develop a football arm that's mechanical and that throws footballs, as long as I know the size and weight of the football and the wind, I will know exactly the arc that the football takes and where it will land. That is integrating a first order linear differential equation known as Newton's F equals MA. Mechanics is simple. That's why high IQ people in school study electromagnetism. It's hard. Mechanics is simple. The mind of the market is the same. Two weather fronts are colliding, in my opinion. The first one, we all know, it's the Lehman Brothers global financial crisis. It's the detritus of it. It's what's left of the Lehman, of the Lehman Brothers story. When's the recession going to end? Is it? Will it be a double debt? Why is unemployment so high? And can how this have been the worst recovery in modern history for us, despite the biggest fiscal and monetary stimulus, certainly in 50 years? You agree that's confusing, yes? Mm -hmm. So what's going on? It's up to people like me to make sure we know that that's very simple to explain. But I'm not going to talk about that today. This problem is now colliding with <coughs> something else that wasn't supposed to hit until the year 2020. The second weather front is I'm going to call it the demographic crisis of the democracies of the West. Everybody now knows the kind of stuff I was writing about 30 years ago. Governments have promised benefits that nobody can pay for. <coughs> Greece was a wake-up call. Greece had nothing to do with Lehman Brothers. Greece had to do with governments that over-promised retirement ages and benefits and ran out of money. It's broke. If you didn't know it, Germany is broke. Their entire welfare system was unfunded. They pay as you go. France is shallow. Mm -hmm. Italy, gone. Spain, Portugal, whatever. Right. Everybody knew this was happening. It took Meredith Whitney to remind us that 100 cities are going broke so that my parents' strategy of what to do when you get old and be safe of buying municipal bonds, when that's what they all did back then, you wouldn't touch them. I won't, because I know that when push comes to shove, my dedicated revenue bonds will find that their revenues are taken and put into a, quote, special facility where the police and firemen's unions will determine how much I get left. Anyone who doubts me, take a good, hard look at what happened to contract law for the bankruptcy of the General Motors. Don't look too hard. There was no law in order. The unions took it. They had the power of Obama to get it. Things are changing. The old age story was dragged from starting around 2020 to now by the Greek crisis and the contagion that followed. We can no longer think we can wait and kick the can down the alley until that period. Let me repeat, the European events that have taken the second weather front and shifted it forward to today or all those issues of the bankruptcy of the welfare state. Now, in America, we haven't had that problem yet. But we had something else bring that second storm back to today. And that was the Tea Party. The Tea Party, interestingly, is very easy to laugh at. I think the New York Times deigned to call them trailer trash. Maybe they use the word smelly to boot. But they aren't very smart. They not only haven't been to, but couldn't spell Renaissance weekend. But that's where you're supposed to go on your spare weekends if you're Hillary Clinton. You network with smart Ivy League people. All of us are privileged. 
privileged police got it all wrong. They still don't get it. The Tea Party was right. The SS welfare state express, whether it's Greece, Sacramento, Washington, or New York City, is a train careening downhill with nobody in charge, and it's really bad. And that's the subject I know lots about. But I wrote about this first in 1981. It was all easy to see these demographic things are long run. So here we are. The Tea Party's view was this is so serious, we're not going to allow death ceilings to rise or anything to happen until somebody does something about the problem of an out of control, bankrupt government. It's absolutely no different than any other Western countries. It's just a matter of when. I was just down in Australia. They have the least problems. Because they had problems in 1980 when bust. And then Hawke and Keating's two successive prime ministers fixed it. And they have a social security surplus. They're just great in Australia. Plus they've got China and everything else. They're the happiest country, followed by Switzerland. Greece is at the bottom. We're all in between. The Tea Party came as a result of TARP, Trouble Asset Relief Program, and Obamacare. There's a, up like this Wall Street thing that's so easy to laugh at, the sit-in that's going on. These people just sort of rose up spontaneously and said, what the hell's going on here? Our futures are being mortgaged. What are we going to do about it? So now we're caught between two fronts. And the way to summarize the import of all of this is to say, well, the recession is getting a little bit better. A little better. Isn't that light at the end of the tunnel down there? Is it? Or is it the headlight of an oncoming train? That's the point. Anyone confused? Good. It's that confusion that turns into that market's way up markets way down, crazy stuff going on. This is very important implications for investment management I'll talk about in a minute. Is anyone here happy about our leadership? No. I, don't, I like Obama, I'm just saying, but I think there's a leadership problem. Well, you already hear what they say about leadership in Australia. Berlusconi, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> it's all a joke. But there are no leaders. Where is Augustus? De Gaulle. Caesar. Where are the leaders? So it's easy for someone like me to poke fun at these people, isn't it? But you see, that's not epistemologically legitimate. Let me tell you why. One of the great discoveries of historiography and sociology is that if you take any population anywhere, the distribution of human types is an invariant, as is the speed of light. It's the same. The proportion of good guys and bad guys, leaders, non-leaders, funny guys, self-important people, it's always been this. Now, I know it was true 5,000 years ago because I was there. <laughs> I spent a gap year, part of it, in the interior of Papua New Guinea 40 years ago, and it was 5,000 years ago, <laughs> literally. And the twinkle in the eye, jealousy, Human nature never changes, which incidentally is why a particular form of art in the 20th century is the sino shore of our era. There was only one art form that caught life right. It was the soap opera. It always was about jealous women upsetting things. <laughs> Four Nobel laureate poets have agreed with that point, so don't accuse me of having a problem. <laughs> so, if it's true, that human nature doesn't change, yet we don't see leadership, maybe the problem is the game we're playing itself changed. Oh, that's right, yes, history is nothing but that observation. The same kind of kings, when all they had were bows and arrows, are going to create a very different history than kings with rockets, jet planes, and nuclear bombs, correct? <coughs> that's right. So think of Dwight Eisenhower. He was a leader. He coasted on his reputation as the great Western Front General in the war. He came in, he thought the country needed, for a variety of reasons, an interstate highway system, and he got it. He made things happen, correct? Let's say we have Dwight Eisenhower today, we disinter him. He's running the show, same Dwight. Do you think he'd get anything done? Would you like to know why he wouldn't? Because there were 75 yards in eastern Iowa, which we've discovered to be 
the habitat of the trisexual spotted brown squirrel. <laughs> that means the bankruptcy of 229,000 construction companies in 25 years in court, correct? And you wonder why we don't get things done. The Chinese are a new empire, aren't they? <coughs> there are no special interest groups of that kind. They want to move the Yangtze River and move 30 million people. They did. Come back in 150 years. This is my favorite book, Monker Olson's The Rise and Decline of Nations. He dealt with all kinds of empires through history. The story was always the same. You start off like a veal, a calf, lean, no fat, great cuts of meat. And the veal turns into a marbleized fat cow that you go pay $80 to have a steak at Ruth Chris. <laughs> it's as it gets fat and marbleized that the special interest groups all get all their tentacles in, and there's so many. Dwight Eisenhower was not elected by K Street. <laughs> now you are. So many special interest groups. They get in so deep that a game theoretical paradox occurs. There was no one left to represent the all player coalition known as you and me, the citizen rape. No one represents us at all. The whole ship of state goes down. Meanwhile, not because they're bad people or irrational the people running the Sierra Club or the business round table are all doing their best to keep their own jobs and advance their interests and pay for their own kids' tuition, correct? There are no Hitlers at fault here. But the whole thing just collapses. That's not good news. Let me move to the Euro. Without apology, this is a very complicated subject. All I'm going to do is try to give you two very different perspectives on it. But do not kid yourself. It is the crisis of the Earth right now. If it goes bad and there's a panic in Europe and the Euro goes down, UBS has said you could face a 28% drop in OECD output. That's a great depression everywhere. If it all goes right, and the euro is just fine, you get no dividend at all. You just get the status quo we already have enjoyed. <laughs> so this is really a downside risk story, which I'll talk about after clarifying the very fundamental question that is not being asked at all, which is, is a euro good or bad? The public discussion today simply says, we've got to save the euro. Can it be saved? We have to save the euro to save the banks. Sound familiar? We have to save the euro so that West London's bank doesn't go under. Excuse me? Who gives a flying whatever about West London's bank? Doesn't anyone care about the well-being of 17 populations affected? See, economics is about which policy, A or B, is good compared to the other. More analytically, which policy maximizes the greatest good for the greatest number? Not what's good for Germany, not what's good for the banks, but simply what's good for everybody. That's what we do. It's like everybody has a vote. So is zero good or not? Let me answer that question. Then the question of, given that we have the euro, what's required to prevent the crisis? To understand the euro, you have to understand a little bit of economic theory, the concept of controllability. It's simple. Tinbergen was the first man to ever get the Nobel Prize in economics in history. He proved in 1953 some things that made it possible to have modern macroeconomics of the kind that Jack Kennedy first applied. Keynes had all the ideas. Keynes did not have the ability to know how you turn which knobs, when and why, and trying to do a good job of turning the economy to full employment and prices. Tinbergen figured out, to be fair to Keynes, the mathematics needed to do this, known as optimal control theory, was invented in 1948-49 in Russia and in California. It wasn't available to Keynes writing his general theory in 1937. One of the things you find is whether you're running a rocket ship or an economy, it's a general principle of dynamical systems that if you have end goals, you have to have at least and independent knobs on the dashboard that you can tweak to achieve your end goals. In economics, our goals are typically full employment and price stability. N equals two. There are two goals. 
So you have to have at least two knobs to turn. So you are in charge, Derek, of the Fed. You can raise and lower interest rates. And Bob, you are in charge of the fiscal structure. And you can raise and lower government deficits. You can do yours in your direction and yours in yours. They're independent of each other. Is that what you're going to say? That would be nice to have 14 knobs you can find to. It means when you land on the moon, it's much more smooth than having just two, some bit of a bumpy landing. But if you don't have enough, you miss the moon, go to Mars, and never come back. This is called controllability. It is the absolute key to understanding the Euro. Now, I was present at the creation of the Euro because I was in the Davos faculty from 88 to 94 when it was all conceived by a man named Jacques Delors. The Euro, regardless of what I'm about to say, has obvious benefits. And incidentally, no one ever thought that his Euro would ever happen. By 1997, it would become a political project. We'll become the United States of Europe, and you couldn't stop it. And there are many people who question it. I think it's done darn a good job. You have Polish plumbers. Problem. They all seem to work in London, which is not part of the Euro, but that's all right. <laughs> you have one passport, one zone, no boundaries, no exchange rates. Europe's got a lot of good, absolutely. The question is, what isn't good? Here we have the difficult news. This is the important point. This is what's happening today. Up top, we have the Europe before the 17 <coughs> now members of the Euro joined the Euro. There are all these different countries. It was a bit of a pain. There were so many exchange rates. But every country had the same goals of apple pie and mother, correct? Full employment, price stability, and proper trade balance. Yes? And every country could change its currency, its interest rate, its fiscal deficit to adapt to the speed bumps that came. Yes? You had complete controllability for all 17 countries. Government could serve its people by adapting to a shock. Then you join the Euro. At midnight, Jack the Ripper comes out with a scythe, and three of the four knobs are sliced off the dashboard. So now there's going to be only one interest rate, at least on the short end of the yield curve, one currency. one money group. If Jack had been German, not English, I suspect the third knob would have been sliced off as well. Now this is terrible. This means not even Germany. Nobody has controllability anymore. Is that clear? No one has enough degrees of freedom. But is that bad? This is the important answer. Suppose you do a correlation analysis of the GDPs for 30 years of all the countries. France, Spain, Spain, Italy, Italy, Greece, Greece, France, etc. Et 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 you have 17 members of the euro. 17 times 16 divided by 2 is the number of pairs. So let's just study how correlated the GDPs are. And the answer is, let's say we find out that every single number is 1.0. That is, for every pair of economies, their GDP swing perfectly in sync. What? Who cares about controllability? There'll be one setting of the knobs that's good for everybody. What's good for any goose is good for any gander. Correct? No problem. Euro's perfect. Well, let's see what happened in reality. In reality, the average correlation within about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.58. Now, that's a way of saying they swing somewhat together, not in unison. But the problem is we're all wearing one tuxedo of one size. It would have fit all of us perfectly if we're identical. But now that I've gotten fat and you've gotten thin, you look a bit baggy and I'm stretched, beginning to be a little bit uncomfortable. Because we all have to live with one setting of the knobs. But this, when I was introduced, you heard I said that you don't want to extrapolate the future, extrapolate the past into the future. You have to think twice. 
So what I want you to do is ask the question, pretend we keep the euro, you go to sleep, you know the euro's there, you wake up in 2020. Now what's the correlation going to have been between 2007 and 2020, between two blocks, the periphery six countries and the 11 solid countries? Are they going to swing together or opposite? Anyone have any intuition? Well, let's take the last four years. That's 16 quarters of data. Hmm? Minus 0.2. If the economies are even down to 0.3, God forbid zero or minus 0.3, you don't even want to be there. It means you're condemning to a 40% unemployment rate the young people of six countries. Excuse me, what the hell is going on? That is not good for people, even if it saves West London's bank balance. So the fundamental graph, theoretically here, is this one. I'm going to stand away from the light. On this vertical axis, we have the degree of correlation. <laughs> High means 1.0. Everyone's perfectly correlated. Then you have a zero. You're completely independent. And then I guess you go up to where everyone swings oppositely. I don't think that's mathematically possible, but forget that embarrassment. <laughs> On this axis, you measure the welfare cost in terms of human happiness of the price of not being able to respond, the price of non controllable If you're down here on this axis and everybody swings together, as I've already said, on this axis, you near zero two, there's no cost. Because the optimal thing for Germany is the optimal setting for Greece, yes. But the more you go this way, towards less and less correlation, boy, are people miserable. That's the problem. It's easy to then say, we'll take four nations out of the euro, whereas we don't know how to do it. Their currencies will fall in half. <coughs> They'll all go basically broke because they owe debts they can't repay because the debts are euro denominated. So that's the problem. And no one really has an answer. I think the best thing probably is to take the weak sisters out. It will mean massive currency devaluation. That's good for Greece. People will go there as tourists. I can't go to Greece as a tourist with the euro where it is. It's a new drop off. And of course, the terrible thing then is they can't pay back their bank loans, which are euro denominated, because you've now doubled your amount of loans if your own currency is falling in half. So what, quote, the authorities in the larger West must do is to say, we will take care of that. We will settle your debts. We will restructure your bank, but we'll do nothing unless you start paying your taxes and getting your act together. We exact the price of structural reform in order to permit them to get out from under their debt loads and to have an ongoing cheap currency so Woody comes and buys its goods and services. Then you say to the remaining people, we're going to back you to the Yazoo. We're going to have a four or five trillion dollar facility to be sure that no one attacks the currencies anymore, that no one pulls these things. You are ring fenced in the true sense of the word. Now, the thinking is moving in this direction, but it's not there yet. Tentatively, everybody wants to save the whole euro. I mean, Greece just cannot be saved. But that's not it. To wrap this somewhat technical discussion up, there's a final slide. Now we move to a new question. Is there going to be a crisis or not? For this, I use a simple Harvard Business School event tree. I find these very useful. They make use of something known as the concept of the monotonic ordering of causal relationships. Let's take all the variables and make a path of all the best outcomes. We don't have a recession, a non-euro recession. We don't have a double debt. The authorities act fast. The central bank, European governments, and Christine Lagarde at the International Monetary Fund are completely 
unified, and when they act, they act big. The bailout fund isn't some wimpy 500 billion in a 15 trillion economy, rather it's a good five trillion. So the markets know no one's gonna screw with us. You diffuse contagion in events. If all these wonderful things happen, <coughs> you don't have any hit. You continue with 2% GDP growth for the OECD. Not much of an upside. This is all a downside story. And if you flip these and the worst outcomes happen, not the worst, I didn't even allow for the whole thing to fall apart, but so the things that I could see happening. You have the OECD at minus six. That's worse than the height of 2008. <coughs> so the problem is, when you talk about the probabilities, the bottom is much more probable than the top. The risk is they'll do too little, too late, the contagion will spread. Let me give an example. AIG, we acted too late. It was a $15 billion problem Tuesday noon, and by Friday it was a 35, no, it was an $85 billion problem. Bernanke, late 07, when the housing crisis was really getting going, said it could be a $150 billion price tag. We now know it was three trillion. He was wrong by a factor of 20. My worry here is that by dithering and waiting, the cost to Europe of sort of straightening out this mess will explode. Then the German people will say, it was bad enough when we had to contribute X, but 20 times X, we are out of here. This is not our problem. That is a concern. Secretly, I hope, they're getting their act together because they're scared. That's what we're trying to do, scare them into acting. But they're it's a pretty bad situation. If you want to know what your short-term risk is, it's not a double dip. Our economy is going to be slow, period. It's this, and this is serious. If you believe in efficient market theory and all of that, and all of its assumptions that are very wrong, because they're not descriptive of reality, we learned from the great Nobel James Tobin in 1958 that everybody in this room holds only two assets ever in your whole life. All your money is T percent in the riskless asset, the T bill, and one minus the complement, the remainder of it is in the risky market cap weighted portfolio. That is to say, all the bonds and stocks and horse farms and vineyards, and I want a slice of that. That's my risky. Now, when I'm a young Turk, I'll have 85% of my money in the market risky portfolio and 15% under the mattress. But when I'm an old biddy, I reverse that, of course. That was easy, but that was an artificial world where you didn't have any government problems and none of the kinds of things we're all worried about today. It was also a world assumed, even though in 58 they didn't use the word efficient market yet, it assumed essentially no one has private information. Everybody knows the same thing. So Hogan beat the market by being smart in buying Tom's company, not Tim's company. That didn't come up. You can laugh at that. But if you're a huge pension fund, this was the beginning of modern finance. It's known as the Tobin separation theorem. It's pretty powerful. Anyone who's ever done a, what's it called, CFA course, We'll remember Cap M, the capital asset pricing model. Three different people invented that in 1961 and 62. It was a footnote to this important paper. This was the beginning. Well, don't even look at that anymore. Everything has changed. Alice looked at herself in the looking glass and she was upside down. Governments are now riskier and rated riskier than Johnson & Johnson. What I want to do is repose the question of what you're supposed to do when you get older with your money. Let me say if you're young and working for a hedge fund and you like trading endogenous risk and surfing trends and overshoots, you've got a great future. There's always money to be made when markets thunderously go up and go down. But suppose you're Coco Chanel, who got it right 
and to realize that she said that a rational woman of my age of 70 would only want one thing, and that is prepaid suite of rooms at the Ritz in Paris on the Cote Vendôme, <laughs> pressing and food included. <laughs> it's called an annuitized standard of living. Now, of course, she was right. And she never met him, but Franco Medigliani at Chicago and MIT would get his Nobel Prize for proving mathematically what she said. The paper was called Optimal Life Long Investment Savings and Consumption. You don't want to protect your money. You shouldn't think twice about how's my portfolio done this year with all due apologies. What you should worry about is whether you continue to live in the house you like or not. Take my parents. They were well enough off, but not so much they didn't have to worry. When they got old, they lived in New York State. The income taxes in the sort of late 60s, 70s were 79%. But if you wanted something safe when you're old, people like them would often have a lot of their money in municipal securities, correct? Yeah, 3.8% tax-free when you'd have to get 16% or something of a risky asset after tax to stay in your house. But the problem was they couldn't buy tips. Dad retired in the year when the inflation rate had been a pretty constant 2.4% for 80 years, except during rationing of the wars. That, that, that doesn't count. Little did he know that he'd be wiped out by inflation. A lot of those bonds ended up at 15 cents on the dollar the year he died in 1981. So they lost their room at the Reds because they didn't keep up, all right? What do you do today to keep your room at the Reds, to stay in your nice waterfront house in Maine? How do you protect yourself? Worrying about whether I'm up 2% or 20% isn't the issue. When you get old, living on capital becomes unpleasant. That is, unless you're very rich. You want income. Now those municipal securities paid a nice fixed income every year. That was the problem, it was fixed. What do you do with your money? Well, I think we're living in a crazy environment. I see governments going bust. I see Nestle surviving. So let me just outline a couple of thoughts about what you might do with your money. And I'm not trying to override anything that Ram might be suggesting. I'm just trying to get us to think a little bit differently about what to do in an environment which isn't like the past. And I'm glad I started with municipal securities. I mean, Meredith, what's her name, Meredith Whitney, has published a paper listing the 100 cities that will go bankrupt. Never occurred to my parents about it. Now, of course, you can say, well, my revenue bonds are such that I get the revenues from the Cleveland Turnpike. No one can take that away from me. My municipals, unlike general obligation municipals, are safe. Yes. No, they're not. If push comes to shove, look at General Motors. The state will take all the revenues and put it into a special holding tank. A facility will be the polite word. And the labor unions will determine after the policemen get $400,000 of your benefits paid for, how much you get left over. No, I don't trust any of this anymore. I know too much about it. So what do I put my money into? Now we're going to become axiomatic and deductive again. We're going to go high IQ. What properties must my assets have? I want them to have the properties of optionality and incentive structure compatibility. It's a bunch of jargon, but let me explain how worth it it is. All optionality means is that you can, when I invest in something, its management can move from whether the weather gets bad to whether the weather is good. So, Bob is in charge as senior VP of South Asia, finesse me. Bob knows what's going on. He sees a bad anti-business government coming into Delhi. He sees Ceylon opening up with a very pro-business environment. So he moves labor and capital from where the weather is getting bad to where the weather is getting good, correct? I mean, optionality, anybody wants that, that's apple pie, yes? He can move. The second question is, what is his incentive? Suppose his wife loves the house in Hyderabad and doesn't want to move. Well, then Nestle has a policy. Thank you very much. You're fired. It's almost Donald Trump. <laughs> All right. 
And so Bob's not going to say, no, he will move. The incentive structure within these companies, the John Deere's, the Three Andrews, the Nestle's, the Oreos, is such that you move to where the weather is good and you seize on it. But I, as the investor in this team, and why am I investing? To make some money? So it's good for me to know that the people, you who make the money in Mestis, have an incentive to make money by moving to whether weather is good. Does everybody get it? My incentive lines up with yours. The incentives are compatible. You may think this is obvious. Excuse me. Think of the government. Does the US government have optionality? Or are they chained to their ever-aging, demanding populations? There is no Ceylon to go to. As far as their incentive is to get reelected, and you do that by kicking the can down the alley, cooking the books, lying and cheating. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're bad people. They are not. It's that the system is such that if Millie doesn't promise more benefits, I will. If I don't promise more benefits, she will. So it's a gentleman's agreement. Election after election after election, more benefits, more this, more that. The future is bankrupt. It's not due to bad people. It's a systemic problem. It can only be changed by fundamental constitutional changes, preventing government from mortgaging our children's future. That's what's needed. We need political theory. We don't need macroeconomics. The great questions today have nothing to do with economics. That is why my economics friends are so boring. They don't ask the right questions, and they are incapable of presenting the right answers, including Larry Summers at Harvard, who is smart enough to know that. The problem of political philosophy is a moribund discipline that morphed into the history of what Rousseau thought. Well, we've got to bring it back to life, the way Moncker Olson did in his Rise and the of Nations is a few people. Now, not only do I want optionality, and I want a good incentive system. Remember, I'm, I want dividends or interest or something to keep me in my room at the risk. I have another problem. Now, this is a real problem. i got to protect myself against inflation and deflation. Now, that's another talk for another day. Inflation is a very complicated topic, to say the least. We don't think it is, but it is. And remember, gold bugs have been largely wrong throughout history in their bets. And deflation has happened far more than they're supposed to since, oh, it's so easy, we'll just print our way out of it. No, you won't print your way out of it because the bond market will eat you alive and high long-term interest rates will be such that you won't build one new house, one shopping center, or one plant. The conceit the government can just print when everyone knows what they're doing is wrong. Ask the Greeks. Ask the Portuguese. The central bank cannot control the bond yield. It can control only the overnight money rate, the Fed's funds rate. Inflation can happen. It's easy to do it. It may not be very good to do it, but they can do it. Oh, they can print money. And of course, we all know they have been printing masses of money. It's called QE1 and QE2, $2 trillion of assets the Fed bought in, correct? And to buy those assets in all those mortgage backs and government, how does the Fed pay for that? Can I hear the word? It begins with a P? Print. print. There's only one problem. The Fed doesn't print money. Ever. Zimbabwe printed money. That's why you find $100 million bonds sold at Skipwell Airport from the Reserve Bank of Australia or Weimar, Germany. $100 billion. Notes, excuse me. Notes, dollar bills. America, we have hundred dollar bills. Have you noticed we don't have any more? The amount of currency in circulation, which is a liability of the Fed, is about eight hundred billion dollars and hasn't changed in years. We don't print money. We print bank reserves. Citicorp buys in two trillion for the Fed in QE one and two. We pay for them by electronically crediting the reserve account, which by law Citicorp as a primary dealer must keep with the New York Fed. Take a look. The Fed hasn't printed any money in the last four years. It's printed bank reserves. The good news is no one wanted to borrow. 
just as for 20 years, the Nakagama family never borrowed in Japan. If banks have reserves and no one's borrowing, the reserves sit there on dry ice. They're known as idle reserves. We have, by a factor of 15, the largest amount of idle reserves in the history of the country. Right this minute. They're idle. The problem is, when the sun comes out, we all are go borrowing. Then those reserves get turned into high-powered money. If I line up, and you line up, and you line up, and you borrow, you get your $500 million loan on Monday, you get yours on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But since you can lend 10 times the amount of your free reserves, if the Fed has created 1.6 trillion of free reserves, you could have 16 trillion of new loans in everybody's account. It's not just the quantity of money is there. No one borrows without planning to spend. Why are you going to pay an interest rate to hold money you don't use? Keynes put that. So we all go spend. So the quantity and the velocity of money explodes, and you have hyperinflation. The problem is, what do you do when the weather comes out and the sun comes out? It used to be the Fed would have to take all those assets it bought in and sell them back. It's called slimming its balance sheet back down, which can raise rates. But the real problem is, since it now holds 1.2 trillion, I think it is, of mortgage-backed securities that no one wants, it can't do that. So the good news is, the Fed now has a new control knob. It's called the, the reserve remuneration rate. It's brand new, two years old. The Fed can now say to city court when the weather comes out. But rather than giving you, which we have now, 25 basis points on all your reserves. That's right, the Fed pays the banks that hold all those reserves a quarter of a percent return. Overnight, the Fed now has the law, the power, which it didn't, to make that 5%. So when the Fed jacks up the remuneration rate, Citicorp fires 12,000 bankers who are out there hustling for bad credits like me, begins to have five martini lunches, does nothing, and uh, they get a nice 5% risk-free return from the Fed for holding their dry eyes. Got it? My point here is anyone who thinks that we have to have inflation is wrong. But people do think that. They also forget something else. Deflation, prices going down, is much worse than inflation. This is such an important point. If you're trying to keep your room in the Ritz, then let me explain the iceberg theorem. Now, who am I going to pick on now? You. Your great-grandfather of 1900. How much credit card debt do you think he had? <laughs> you. Me. You with the yellow tie. You had none. How much mortgage debt on his Residential house. We think, we don't know, because of the data, that the household debt was 1% of GDP. Anyone know the number today, roughly? 115 or 20, I think. I think it's come down. Here is what the iceberg theorem says. It's very important to understand. It is why deflation is a catastrophe. When people didn't have debt, who cares if prices go down? My wages drop in half, and the price of bread falls in half, and why would it be different? I get the same number of bread. You saw this in Brazil in the 50s and 60s. Sometimes you'd have 1,000% inflation, then it would fall in half. People lived the same. But things aren't the same. The iceberg theorem is what happens the night the Titanic sunk. The iceberg is 91%, isn't it 91% underwater? Hmm? 85. Is it 85% underwater? Yes? That's good, thank you. <laughs> the ocean, the sea level, is the wage rate. Here's the Titanic. It's us. Our constitutes, our conceits, our expectations. The music is playing. The lights are burning bright. The difference is, the iceberg isn't floating. God's holding it on a string at a fixed level because it's fixed nominal debt. Wages 
are now zero. With a double dip, they'll be minus two. Ask the question, if the wage level starts dropping linearly, sort of at the same rate, is the difficulty of repaying your debt going to rise linearly or nonlinearly? I'm waiting. Answer? Hypergeometrically, very nonlinear. You don't have a problem. You don't have a sovereign debt problem. You have a civil war. Everyone's defaulting on everybody else. That's it. Bernanke understands that completely. He's the only one. If you want to worry, worry about that. Now, I want an asset that protects me against inflation and deflation. So I'm going to sketch this because the time's out. Uh, very quickly, I can't touch gold because gold won't pay with deflation. In 1937, they threw gold coins from J.P. Morgan at 23 Wall Street. People couldn't use them. Gold's good in the inflation. But if I lose half my money because I lose it half one way or another, I'm out of my room at the Ritz. So I have to be careful. Now, I want dividends. I don't want interest payments. I don't want tips. The Greek bonds dropped 90% in value, but tips wouldn't have helped. Because inflation didn't go up. Does everyone understand that? Inflation didn't go up. So tips don't work. Corporate bonds have no tips. I don't want them. What do I want? I want income to pay my rent. I want income that keeps up with the rent. Nestle, Oreo, etc. I want to take the big companies that are incidentally making all their money, not in the US anymore, I was just with 3M, it's all coming from overseas. They're smart. They can move to where the weather is good, and they did. But I want to partition the set of such stocks into two groups, companies with a lot of debt and companies that are debt light. And this is a very important point. When companies have a lot of debt, they have creditors, yes? And when bad times come, what does the creditor tell you to do with the dividend? Please? Stop it. You have no more income to pay your room. You're out of your room at the rents. <clears throat> but the companies that don't have creditors cut their dividend at the same rate as the rents cuts the rent on the room. You keep your room at the rents. This is a very new era to even be thinking of crazy things like this. But they're pretty common sense. So I think we have to go back 50 years, as Peter Bernstein would say, to when dividends are what it was all about for a variety of reasons. And dividend was a dirty word for the past 35 years. It was all a game about my market value going from 10 to 70 million. Jack Welch was great. He, he, he was like a Stephen Jobs. He jacked the PE of General Electric from 9 to 60. He was a showman. It was great. He cooked the books. Ask his successor. Great guy. <laughs> Our portfolios went way up and then way down. Well, when I'm old, I don't want that much. But actually, I don't mind fluctuations in my wealth as long as I know my income, in real terms, is secure. I think for many people, very rich people shouldn't even listen to what I'm saying. They can have it both ways. I'm talking about just keeping your room till you're dead. Now, last, and then we're finished, this issue of who's to blame. In my book, I have to deal with this. The book is all about why the left and the right are both wrong. Very simply, on the left, the blame is that of liberals. And there are a number in this room. A liberal is a phony liberal. Somebody who's very much for the average people who can't wait to tell you how he or she voted Democratic. I mean, can you imagine voting for those troglodytes of the Republican Party? A liberal celebrates his or her humanity in liberals. And a liberal is defined as phony liberal, as I believe a man is as good as a woman. I believe a black person is as good as a white person. I believe a straight person is as good as a gay person. But I believe if you retire in the next generation, you're one six as good as I am, I'm going to hose you through the wall. I'm a pederast. <laughs> My family got Social Security of their lifetime back in 2.6 years their lifelong contributions, their grandchildren will get it back in maybe 26 or 27 years. Divide the two, and I don't know what you get. An eight to one intergenerational 
screw you ratio, as I called it there. Was 30 years ago, I was thinking about these things when it all came true. Right? Now, if you're really a liberal, you say, excuse me, we're going to treat all cohorts of old people the same. Everybody will have the same give-get ratio, yes? We have not done that. We have hosed our children's future. State governments are doubling tuition in two years. Kids can't even pay their ridiculous college loans. They're not going to pay. But don't think that Eric Desideratum, that man in Houston, didn't finally get his $2.8 million dollar operation at age 92. He'd been a fireman. He had a self-esteem crisis. And they convinced him that if he had a sex change, he'd be happy once again. So he had it at your expense. You don't read too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> These liberals are a big problem. Now we come to conservatives. The great problem with conservatives is that essentially they think they deserve their good luck. Anyone who's rich who thinks it's because you're smart, as my billionaire friend Kerry Packer told me, well, when you meet someone who thinks he deserves his success, he politely said he'd been a real jerk. <laughs> it's not even an opinion. Read anybody who's done well. Bill Gates, Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain's coach fell in love with him. He got a boost. He didn't break his ankle when he could. By the fundamental theorem of Kenneth Arrow of 1953, capitalism requires you are hedged against every risk. Let me give an example of how powerful this is to understand taxation and the distribution of wealth. And I know this is a real no-no subject. So of course it was made for me. <laughs> so here we go. I'm a writer. I'm a good writer. They all tell me that. I've written six books all reviewed by the New York Times. You are a good author. You also, just like me, same age, same number of books, same reviews, we're identical. We're about to come out with a new book. We keep hoping one of us will make the bestseller list and get rich, yes? Something happens. Oprah Winfrey happens. There's a chance, an equal chance, that she'll find your book to review or mine. She only does one of those types of books a year, right? If your picture income isn't the 75,000 you would make and I make and we have made, it goes to seven million, yes? If mine is picked, I get seven million and you're languishing at 75,000. The distribution of income is very skewed, correct? Wrong. If we've been able to hedge that, you and I would have taken out a contract and assuming we have the same attitude towards risk, we face the same probability of Oprah noticing me versus her, the result would then be we would rationally sign a contract, an insurance contract, as you all do to protect your art collections and your houses, whereby if your house burns down, I pay you and vice versa. And our contract would be if I'm the lucky one, we'll split the money in half, and if you're the lucky one, we'll split the money in half, and the distribution of wealth under true capitalism is flat. <coughs> So we live in a world where since 95% of risks can't be hedged, the lucky just love the fact that they were lucky, never had to ante up their insurance payments. This can be used to justify a very progressive tax system. It's known as the missing markets theorem. This has nothing to do with feeling I'm being asked to help the needy. Wrong. That's another reason, going back to the utilitarians, why the rich pay a higher percentage tax than before. These are basic points. No one discusses them. But now you have this revulsion in Warren Buffett having taxed the half the tax rate of his receptionist. Both sides have plenty to explain. The movement on Wall Street to occupy it. Again, you can laugh at those ridiculous people. They don't really know what they're doing. Yes, they do. And it's growing for a reason. It's growing for a reason. People all over know the system is front-loaded to favor the finance industry, which itself is a disgrace. People are tired of it. They don't like it. These are well-meaning people. 
These are not people who want to get rid of the banks or anything. These are people who want the system so that at least it's <coughs> fair, fairly. If you listen to this, it's very interesting what's happening right now. So that's the end of my talk today. I tried to, to suggest that here there's blame on both sides. Everybody wants an investment tip. I've got one for you. Get out your pencils. There's only one thing you should buy if you really want to make money, because you'll need it in the future. And buy a pitchfork company. They're coming after you. Thank you very much. <laughs>